A very warm welcome to you, dear guests, in the audience, online, and are on a panel. I'm thrilled that so many of you are interested on the interplay between science and politics. I heard that we are hosting the largest round table, so I think that's, that's something already. <laughs> My name is Alexandra Pates. I'm the managing director of the Berlin University Alliance, and today I'm your host. When preparing for this round table, I asked myself, how much time, time do I spend communicating with politicians or organizing dialogue events like this? Whether I use that time efficiently, whether it was enough, and what my challenges are. So my guess was it's 30%. I don't know if that's enough or if, it, or if it's good, but some of these questions we will discuss today with our high-level panelists. Before I, introduce them, uh, before I introduce them to you, I want to get to know you a little bit better. So, please stand up <laughs> if you work in science and academia. <laughs> all, the <front> <laughs> all the front lines, thank you very much. Please stand up if you work in the field of politics or public administration. Don't be shy. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. It's quite balanced. Please stand up if you work in any other field. Wow. A special welcome to you, too. Thank you very much. So I think we have a quite balanced um, audience, and I hope we manage to organize a balanced um, panel as well. And I want to introduce you our panel very, very briefly. We couldn't feel more delighted than having Professor Dr. Maria Leptin with us. She's the president of the European Research Council, and she will give us the European perspective of the exchange between science and society. Welcome. I'm especially glad that Armaran um, Nagipur, the Berlin State Secretary of Science, Research and Equality, accepted our invitation and made it because this week, obviously, she's fully booked on Berlin Science Week. <laughs> Professor Geraldine Rauch took over the role as president of the Technical University six months ago. Last week, the role of spokesperson of Berlin University Alliance. She's my boss now, so I had to invite her. <laughs> Tomorrow, the University of Oxford will sign a Memorandum of Understanding with the Berlin University Alliance for their partnership. Professor Dr. Andrew Horrell is the academic director of this partnership and one of the persons that made it happen that Oxford does a partnership, a university-wide partnership above department level, I think for the first time. So thank you very much for that and welcome. In my former appointments, I was a management consultant and later on an executive assistant. So I know how influential advisors can be. We are very keen to hear about Alessandro's insights as policy advisor, assistant to, and I have to read that out because that's a very important person, European Commission Deputy Director General well, for Research and Innovation. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here. What a panel. Well, as I mentioned before, um, I roughly use 30% of my time communicating at the interface between science and politics. And my first question to you of all, to you, of, all of you here on the panel is, please write down, you have a card in front of you, how much of your working time do you roughly spend at the interface between science and politics? And while you're thinking and writing, I ask also the audience to think a little bit about the question, how much time of your working time do you spend at the interface between science and politics? Okay, I go in front because I want to see it too. <laughs> Please hold it up. Wow, between zero and 100, that's a <laughs> wide range. Above 90, 10%, 45%, 30 to 40%. Okay, that's a very wide range. Is anybody below 10% here in the audience? Would anyone say he spends less than 10%? Okay, hands up, hands up so we can see it. Less than 10. Okay, and anybody more than 90? Wow, 
okay, you should be here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Maria, what is um, especially important to you in those 90% of your working time? Well, that's hard to um, uh, that's hard to say. I can tell you what's especially pleasant, and that okay. is to listen to the scientists because that is my passion, and uh, that's why I'm in, I'm in science. What's especially important? Well, talking to politicians and making politicians understand the value of fundamental science. As you probably know, the ERC funds uh, fundamental frontier science, basic science, and um, I can understand that politicians care about the application of science. We have to do that. We need science to solve big challenges. Um, but that can't be done without the uh, underlying basic science. So uh, I, I do that, um, spend time for that. I did that in my previous job too, um, getting politicians to understand that that costs money and that that money is not wasted. So that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. And um, that understanding, I think, is, is, is the key to at least our work. Okay, thank you. Armagan, you, since one year you are political charge for science and research in Berlin. Among others, before that, you worked in the, I think, PR department of the German parliament in communication. So you are a communication expert, I would say. <laughs> if you look back at this past year, what is your main key learning from communicating with scientists? <laughs> main key learning? Well, I would say it's important to notice that politicians actually do listen and are interested in evidence-based, science, scientifically-based opinions because they are crucial to policymaking and they're dependent on it. I mean, in, in our ministry in Berlin, uh, we have the combination of health and science, among other areas, uh, important areas like gender equality, for example, in research. So we have seen these interdependencies and partnerships between science and politics. And I really did notice that it's crucial to us, it's crucial to policymakers, to politicians, to have these informations, to gather these informations, and they are open to it. And I would actually want to invite everyone to get to know the policymaking process, because the policymaking process is very, very complex. and. I mean, politicians, they have back offices. We have in our administration um, experts that are very, very busy and uh, busy doing the policy making, and they are really dependent on these evidence based on this knowledge from scientists. So okay. I would invite everyone to basically join in this process. I would say we accept that invitation, Geraldine. So. <laughs> Maybe um, you can tell us what should politicians know about scientists? What are the two things they should know about scientists so that this uh, invitation <laughs> is easier to, to follow? Uh, so scientists are often uh, very happy about their subject and they love to do their research. And what we really need is that we also give an impact um, to bring um, science into the society because the big challenges we have and the big crisis we are focusing right now cannot be solved by science alone and not by politics. So it's, it's a joint effort and we have to talk about that. And this is really important. And I think for the academic careers, it would be very important uh, that we also appreciate and um, impact um, something like science communication because classically we have like um, uh, scientific uh, stuff and teaching teaching of course is also about uh, building the next generation and um, communication but I think um, the, from the value there um, like um, doing science publication and um, getting funded is, is, um, is the most important to make an academic career but we know that for the big challenges we have that science communication and bringing a science into application is even uh, more important and therefore we should all put a focus on this to bring closer and closer together. Okay, maybe, Andrew, do you want to add on that? Why would science communication integrated in the career of scientists improve the interface, the exchange between scientists and politics? Well, I think it's this one, yes. One, you can answer that in, in general terms, but I think you also have to answer it in terms of where we are, because it seems to me where we are is that the kind of normal 
way of thinking about a stable world of academia, a stable world of the world and of policymakers, where both sides, in a sense, they know what they do, they know what each other does. Policymakers often know more or less the kinds of things they want to know. Academics have their own agendas, and there's this sort of complex process of negotiation between the two. But we're not in that world uh, anymore. And I think the fact that we're not in that world and that we're facing a whole series of interlocking crises really presses us to think about what this relationship might mean. I come from humanities, social science, so for me there are three big things it means. First, it means we think about time. We obviously think about the future because the planetary future is not way out there, it's actually here. Um, but we also need to think, I think, a lot more than we've done about the past, where we've come from, what we need to know about uh, the past. We really need to think about space, the biggest space in the spatiality. The biggest problem I think we all face on both sides is parochialism, ethnocentrism, looking at the world from our own perspective. Of course we do, of course it's valuable, but we've also got to learn to look at the world from other people's perspective. And that finally means, we say thinking out of the box, but actually I don't think it is out of the box. I think it's more thinking how the boxes have come to be the way they are and then thinking how we can rearrange the boxes in different and more innovative ways to face these challenges. Thank you. So you've put on the, uh, the crisis already, which was my topic for the third round. <laughs> but but lots there's lots to say, and we will dive into that deeper. But um, let's take the perspective of the political side a little bit. What should scientists know about politicians and policymakers? What would you say are the two things scientists should know? Thank you. Well, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is distinguishing between certain activities which are related but different. One is scientific advice to policy making, where scientists use their expertise to advise on, for example, possible course of actions and what's the impact of certain course of action or modeling, for example. But another one is advocacy, when scientists use their scientific standing to advocate for certain causes they believe are important. And there's nothing wrong with that, but one has to be very clear when one is doing advocacy and when one is doing advice. And then the third aspect, which is related as well, is lobbying for funding. I mean, uh, in academia, a lot of the funding comes from the public sector. Whenever scientists interact with policymakers, they often use the opportunity to basically ask for more money for research, which again, there is nothing wrong with that, but it risks muddling the waters if you do all of these at the same time uh, wearing different hats uh, in disguise. So I think it's very important that uh, we create settings, institutions, where these uh, interactions can happen in a clear and transparent way. Uh, and I think that there is the risk of putting too much pressure on individual scientists to be doing all of this. And I think we live in an age of uh, disintermediation, but in this aspect, I think we really need to build institutions that can mediate between the world of research and the world of policy making of politics so that you can even out some of the idiosyncrasies and make sure that scientific advice comes from a plurality of view, uh, which is, makes it scientific credible, but also politically legitimate and does not disguise uh, individual uh, agendas. That was my perfect intro <laughs> for the second round, which will be a little bit more about formats of exchange and interaction. And maybe we start with Geraldine, because the vision of the Berlin University Alliance is to cross boundaries toward an integrated research environment by fostering knowledge exchange. So maybe you can say what type of formats has the Berlin University Alliance already set up um, and organized so far for the multi-directional process? Yes, thank you very much. So we are um, in, in the Berlin University Alliance, we are focusing the so-called uh, grand challenges and we are uh, currently searching for the third grand challenge. Um, we had um, already the grand challenge uh, social cohesion and global health. and. Um, now, uh, when searching for the grand challenge, we, we entered a process which is really innovative and which is really discussed around because some researchers say, okay, I will decide what I'm going to research, do my research about and I don't want to talk to about, about it in the society. But uh, the process now is that we talk with um, <laughs> with the society in a very broad way. We talk with students, we talk with um, uh, people f coming from all the parts of society to give their uh, propositions uh, what the next grand challenge could be. And we 
does not just do it on the street, like uh, what could you think we should do our research about, but we really get, got into a dialogue, do workshops, and um, try uh, to, uh, to get in the dialogue um, these uh, propositions for new topics. And this is something very new, because um, usually you always say um, that science is free, so the researcher is uh, free to say what he is going to uh, do his research about. So this is really a debate, and this is a new and, and innovative format. But I also think this is a very nice thing, because we are, we are of course, in a testing phase. but. This also allows us to go, go uh, innovative in new ways, and this is something we really have to, uh, have to try, and I am very proud that we can do it in this alliance, because, um, I mean, uh, every isolated university usually tries to say, okay, I'm the best, um, and we are just going new ways in uh, joining forces, and this is something I really appreciate about our alliance. <laughs> Okay, the ERC, thank you very much. Maria, the ERC is also promoting science policy exchange and its research programs. What's your experience? Under which conditions can this exchange be conducted best? What do you hear from your scientists? Well, uh, first of all, I want to go back to the first round. Okay. But it, relates, <laughs> it relates to what you say. And um, that is about the communication between scientists and politicians. I agree on the one hand that it helps if scientists are trained and told how to uh, relate their research, but that's mostly to the public, which is extremely important because politicians are supposed to listen to the public. But I'm also concerned for reasons that Alessandro gave um, about the muddle between different ways of communicating. So I actually think the most important thing is at the receiving end. I agree that scientists, when uh, politicians, when you talk to them about science, they're excited, just like any citizen is. People love, they have curiosity, they like black holes, they like, uh, you know, figuring out the bones of and our ancestors. So the public is interested in science. What they don't understand, especially in the time in times of crisis, is how science works. And that was your question at the beginning. I think it's important to get everybody to understand, and that too has to start in kindergarten, the scientific method. We, as scientists, all of you, my colleagues down here, we understand that we're never certain. There's uncertainty. And uncertainty doesn't mean we don't know. It means we're at the forefront of research where there is uncertainty, and you politicians better get that. If we say it's 96% certain that the comet is gonna land on Earth, then the comet is gonna land on Earth. And the 4% doesn't mean that we didn't do our work properly, it's in the nature of science. And sometimes we discover four weeks later that we were wrong four weeks ago. Doesn't mean we're stupid, it means this is how science works. And we've seen the bad effects of that two years ago at the beginning of the, of the COVID crisis. So I think that's the most important thing. And so therefore it's important to engage with the press, with journalists and with politicians to understand that. Phew, okay, now about what was your actual question? It you was can breathe, about, yeah. <laughs> take a breath. Um, <laughs> and okay. I can tell you that so, yesterday we were on another yeah. panel and it was the same uh, key takeaway it message really what you're just saying matters. now. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, you know, the defense um, of Fauci and also of our scientists here in Berlin, it, it's be beginning to trickle through, but it has to be more explicit. So mechanisms at the ERC, well, I mean, there are many. We, I personally, of course, as I, that's why I said 90%, um, um, do see it as my role to, to, to mediate that dialogue. And I love listening to scientists, I've already said that. I also enjoy talking to politicians because they're interested. And, you know, I, I attend uh, events in Brussels, for instance, on the, uh, on the uh, use of animal research. But we also have mechanisms. We uh, ask grantees, and several of them are here in, in, in Berlin, to talk at public events, which is, is I think, good, because that really is frontier science. Uh, the ERC, one, awards a public engagement uh, award for grantees to engage with the public, etc. Now, in general, I think the funding, the advocacy, um, politicians have to think about that. Uh, there were big projects like the Manhattan Project or the man landing on the moon. Huge investments and for exciting uh, things, um, not all of them positive, of course. That's fine. The science was already there. Others. Uh, uh, the war on cancer that was started by Nixon in 72, we still haven't won it, but it's led to a huge understanding 
of basic science that has benefited all other fields, including uh, you know, the COVID vaccine. So that distinction has to be clear too. There's, there's a justification for directed research, but it will never happen if you don't do the basic research first. Okay, so that was a very enthusiastic <laughs> um, point there. Andrew, do we still have a blind spot <laughs> uh, based on what we've heard already? Is there still a blind spot we have to tackle when we want to um, better enable the knowledge exchange between both sides? Um, a few things. Firstly, I very strongly um, agree with Alessandro about the different things. Um, the United Kingdom has had now an, an impact agenda on almost all research that's run really, what, five, 10 years. It's uncovered a fantastic amount of really interesting exchange um, engagement. It should be called engagement, not impact, um, but of very different kinds. And it's really important that we're honest and open about the different things that different people do, rather than to try to press people on funding forms or whatever to say they all do the same thing when they don't. Um, so that's the first point. Um, spaces, areas where we can do more. I think it's great as to hear from Geraldine that there is this big discussion about what should be the grand challenges, because I think opening up that question of what should be the big themes of funded research is hugely important. Um, but I think there's a really important space. There's a tendency, well, a great tendency if we have more of that, and then we have at the end of the day, oh, well, scientists take their research to society, to politicians. Um, but there are problems along the way. Um, if you want to get funding, there are enormous incentives to sort of, A, to just take whatever comes in terms of the, the, the big challenge and just accept it, or to kind of pretend you know the answers already before you start, because that's how you put together a really nice, neat package. The really important space is opening up the next little bit, before you get into the real nitty-gritty details of the research project and methodology and case studies, all the things in, in my world. It is opening that space up and getting more input from more different players there before, in a sense, the research starts to run down its track. So I really wish we could do that. That's one really crucial part. And then in terms of other ways in which I think these spaces um, need to be opened up. Um, one is, is access. Um, there's obviously a huge debate about open access, but open access on its own isn't enough. It's not just that politicians, society, NGOs, think tanks can find things on the internet. It is curated knowledge that's really absolutely fundamental to enabling that debate. I spent 10 years working for Oxford University Press, the biggest academic publisher in the English-speaking world, and a vast amount of activity, time, is devoted to this business of curating, navigating, explaining. But most of that is completely closed. And open access, as it's currently structured, won't open that up. It's like what the good librarian does, what the good li digital librarian, and it's finding ways of opening that space up. One of the things I do in the United Kingdom, the British Academy has an early career ne uh, research network um, that we're pi we've got funding for, we're expanding all over the country, and what we're trying to do is not just to include quote-unquote academics. We're trying to include people who work in think tanks, in NGOs, so that they're part of this broader research community, and they can have access to more of the things that happen within the closed or semi-closed world of the university. Thank you, and also for, I think it's important to say, okay, it's not only at the beginning, not only at the end, but during the research process, we have to think about formats. So we have heard about uh, some couple of not only ideas, but really existing formats. Maybe from the other way around, Amaran, do you believe that there are limits to the exchange? Or where are the limitations, if there are any? <laughs> I mean, um, well, thanks so much first for for the um, inputs. Um, I'm taking with me um, a lot of impulses. Um, in my well, my opinion, exchange and communication exchange uh, can be divided into two dimensions. I mean, we have first uh, the exchange on a regular basis. I would say uh, that you can easily uh, feed into your daily life. Uh, you have regular rounds um, on uh, current topics, on maybe very pressing issues. Um, and 
the limits to exchange starts um, where, I mean, you see the rarity um, of uh, finding um, an, well, an environment and also the time to actually deal with the more complex issues and uh, bring in to the dialogue of policy making, all of these uh, just mentioned uh, views from very different directions. And um, this we see, I mean, to bring this together and um, to, I don't know, tackle this challenge, I think, shows the limits, uh, shows the limits of exchange. I, I wouldn't call it limit though, I would probably call it, uh, call it a challenge, uh, <laughs> but um, it, touches rather the second dimension of uh, communication of this uh, of this exchange like um, considering uh, the whole discussion on, on COVID-19 obviously and now uh, the current discussion uh, on the consequences of the energy crisis I mean all these are topics where we obviously need to find the time need to find uh, the evidence-based research uh, to take into the into policy making but it's obviously not decided uh, in the policy making process from one day to the other. Sometimes, unfortunately, it has to be, um, but then you also might see some deficiencies in uh, the decision making process. So I would say these are the limits uh, to the communication. Okay, so we said we need formats on institutional level. The challenges are more maybe on individual level with time. Um, Alessandro, you raised the issue between individual and institutional level. Which side needs more attention? I mean, both need attention, but I think that at the moment the institutional level is very underdeveloped. And I want to pick up on the point that Andrew made about curated knowledge. Because for most policy issues we're facing today, the problem is not that we don't know enough. It's not that if only we had one more data point, one more nature paper, we will then solve climate change or solve uh, health inequality. The problem is that knowledge comes from different disciplines. The world is much more complex than the way we cut it up in our disciplines. And we need to bring all this knowledge from different perspectives together in a curated, consolidated way. Uh, and that requires synthesis. And synthesis is a huge amount of work. It's a work that's currently under-rewarded in science and also requires slightly different skills than doing cutting edge uh, research. Uh, so at the moment, there is a lot of emphasis put on the excellent scientist who's also is a great researcher, but also a great teacher, a great communicator, a great mentor, and a manager, and wins grants. And it's impossible for one person to do all of this. I think we need to realize that scientific careers need to be more diverse, and the role of knowledge synthesizer, of knowledge broker, is an equally valid one, one for which people have to be trained, they have to be rewarded, they have to be given jobs. So you need institutional setups and incentives to facilitate this work of synthesis and consolidation. Thank you. So not only formats, but a new job description. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I didn't see that coming up. A new profession, I would say. <laughs> a new profession. I didn't see that coming up. Okay, before we close this round, we would love to open the floor and hear from you in the audience. So this is how it works. This is a flying microphone. This black thing in here is the microphone. So if you catch it, you speak here. <laughs> I think it will be turned on in a minute. Um, the dice is just the cushion, okay? So you cannot break the microphone, it cannot hurt you. Don't be afraid, okay? <laughs> My question to you is, is there anybody or are there several people who want to share with us a shining example of an exchange format that you thought worked really well? <laughs> we have so many experts in here. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yeah, I throw. Um, Maybe take off your mask. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, my name is Nadine Knapp. I'm a postdoc fellow at Tel Aviv University, and I teach courses in peace psychology. That means I'm interested in how psychology can address like global challenges. And in my lectures, I um, discuss with students basically for one semester one specific topic. For example, it could be challenges regarding migration. And then in the end, um, I invite like politicians from the German parliament and uh, students, they prepare like certain policy papers and then there's an exchange like with politicians. And also what I learned is aside from the content exchange, I also feel 
that students learn that politicians are really interested in like evidence-based science. So I feel it's also prejudice reduction a method in this regard. And I also feel that politicians really learn about like cutting edge research in a very like um, very easy way to access it. So this is what happens like every semester. Thank you very much because that opens up a little bit. The students are an important part of our academic life as well. Anyone else? She can throw it there. Please, <laughs> try. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe take off your mask as well, yes, and we hear you better. Thank you very much. This is a bit of a self-advertisement, but I think it's such a wonderful example. I would like to share it with you. Um, the Australian Academy of Science had little success in engaging with the, our political leaders. We could speak to the opposition, but not the political leaders. Our chief executive persuaded us to introduce a communications program in which we used television producers from Morning Breakfast TV who came into our communications team. And we shared science of the day in videos of about three minutes. Our social media hits went from hundreds to three million. And the prime minister came to see us for scientific advice. So it worked brilliantly. I can give you the advertisement, if you don't mind. Science.org.au, curious. Have a look at it. There's some really fantastic science stories there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I think, uh, a cultural thing, because at least in Germany, breakfast TV has not such a, <laughs> such a big impact. No, it's more the medium, not the breakfast TV. It's the, <laughs> the know, communication <laughs> technique. I know. One last, maybe, one last uh, idea here. And we have here, very black. Oh. Okay. Yeah, Thomas Kropp from Bosch, so industry. Um, I want to point you out to the dilemma and ask you for some feedback from your side. The dilemma is, my experience is, politicians listen the better, the more close the discussion is. Because in the public environment, they always stick to their role, their political party, whatever. Um, and are not able really to divert from the official positions. If you do it behind the curtain, it's the touch of secrecy and lobbying, especially if you're coming from industry, which you also don't like to do because we want to have an open exchange. So I'm heading Bosch Corporate Research. So I'm on the scientific part and I try to infuse with arguments and facts and figures. So this is a dilemma. So, so having a, it a close discussion, which is, has some bad taste, uh, versus having it open, everybody can listen, but it leads to nothing usually. So what's your take on that? I ask Alessandro on that. <laughs> OK. Well, on this point specifically, uh, I, think, I think you need both. And eventually, what you need is accountability, in the sense that politicians, by their very nature, they they have to be held accountable. That's what the democracy is about. So in the end, politicians have to own their decisions. Uh, and it is fine if they decide not to listen to scientific advice, for example. Uh, but what they, it's not fine is saying, uh, for example, shying away from taking responsibility and shielding oneself behind the scientific advice and saying, I'm just following the science. You know, well, I'm doing this because the scientists told me to do that. And that's uh, problematic because it means abdicating political responsibility towards uh, people who are definitely very knowledgeable, but they're not uh, elected. Uh, and also can have, uh, it, taking action has consequences. And it's not the job of scientists to uh, forecast the political consequences of actions. That's the jobs of politicians. So in a way, flipping your question, I think that you need both, but what you really need is democratic accountability for the politicians. Uh, and maybe if I can make one more point about the institutional models uh, that work, one that we have at the European Commission is the scientific advice mechanism, which is a mechanism that brings together scientific academies from across Europe uh, through a consortium called SAPEA. And uh, this creates a, a consortium of about 100 learned societies and scientific academies from all fields, from all across Europe, that can tap into the best uh, uh, knowledge and experts, 
but also, so th that's one part of the mechanism is this consortium of academies, but the other part is a secretariat which is housed inside the European Commission, which has direct access to the policy making process of the European Commission. And the third element is a group of seven chief scientific advisors. Now, these three elements cater to different uh, aspects of the scientific advisory process. This way, you can ensure the scientific credibility and the quality of the scientific advice, but also the policy relevance because you have people who basically are accountable to both words. They have to be, the work has to stand up the scrutiny of the scientific community and of the policy community at the same time. And it's incredibly challenging, let me tell you that, because I worked in that mechanism for two years. Uh, but it really ensures high quality advice that is really bridging the two words of policy uh, and science. And I mean, it's a massive mechanism. It cannot be replicated Alice at scale, can, I, but yes. I would say <laughs> thank you for this enthusiastic um, idea as well. And I heard from, uh, to your question, everyone was uh, saying uh, or agreeing with you that you need both probably. Okay, so I close the second round. And for the third round, I would like to frame our discussion in these current times and pick on what Andrew said at the beginning, that we are in times of multiple crises. And I start with a quote from our German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, who said just at the Nobel Prize ceremony, and I hope I don't misquote, networking matters, collaboration matters, and it matters across national borders, between different disciplines, but also between science, politics, and society. Let me start with you, Amaran. Is there a difference in collaboration in times of peace versus times of crisis? Well, as I was mentioning before, um, of course, forms of collaborations in uh, times of crisis um, take place on a very frequent level. That was basically the first dimension that I was men mentioning. And then forms of collaboration in times of peace, they. I think can more thoroughly address complex issues and need to find um, methods of communication where these complex issues can be addressed. Um, but I do believe that these forms of collaborations, they start by coming together actually in exactly these forms that we have here today or that we have throughout Berlin Science Week. And uh, I mean, we're here right now, I don't need to do too much advertising because you're here already. Um, but to me, this form of, and I was just before mentioning it as some sort of, I mean, it, it, it feels like a festival. And uh, to have this sort of this uh, possibility of exchange with various out of people from various backgrounds is very, very enriching. And uh, I mean, forms of collaborations in times of peace and in times of crisis. I mean, right now we are actually in a time of multiple crises and uh, we see that these forms of collaboration start here, can start here and uh, should start here. So uh, I'm actually very thankful for this uh, opportunity of Berlin Science Week. And I think it brings about these forms of collaborations that we need. Yeah, I think we can all agree on that. Um, Maria, which are the two main worries you hear from scientists, um, but maybe also from politics concerning their work in these times? Well, the f science is international and collaborative by nature. You know, we don't care whether our colleague sits in Cambridge, UK, or Cambridge, US, or in Japan or China. So that, of course, the crisis um, uh, affects that. I don't think otherwise uh, the researchers I know, and I really know the fundamental basic research community, uh, that they think in that way. They do what they have to do. Regarding crisis, A, we're all talking about times of crisis. True, now it's uh, particularly bad, but the next crisis is gonna come and we don't know what it's gonna be. So um, that's one thing. But the most important point about crisis is that it leads to fear. And fear is not a good basis for, dis for decisions and um, for policies. It stops rational thinking, and that's what I'm worried about, that fear leads to you know, immediate uh, uh, back push, and uh, you know, we, we saw fairly insane reactions to Russian artists, writers, uh, scientists, etc., who are against the war and who were going to be banned. I mean, no longer listen to Tchaikovsky, excuse me, what good is that going to do? So uh, th that's what I worry, that crisis uh, sort of wipes out people, higher order thinking capacities. 
um, and it takes a while to get through. Uh, so rational thinking is, 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 is the solution and getting away from fear and listening to researchers and their research is less affected by it. <laughs> Andrew, I know that um, maintaining different dimensions of collaborations in these time is a big issue to you or uh, yeah, may, maybe you want to share your thoughts about that with us. No, I would. Just one quick thing before, which maybe we, I should have said right at the beginning. Obviously, um, Wissenschaft and science are different things. Um, and I think we, we, we also want to recognize that it's not always kind of evidence-based research in that kind of quite hard, quote-unquote, scientific sense, which is important coming from academia. Um, I come from humanity, social science. I study the science of science politics, how policy is made, which is a very diff gives you a very different kind of perspective on the problems we're talking about. But it does mean that ethical, normative, overtly political things are part of what the science community needs to bring to the debate, as well as hard, if you like, evidence-based uh, arguments. And that's a hugely important um, part of, I think, of, of the picture. Um, on the challenges, I mean, I really absolutely couldn't agree more. For me, academic deglobalization is one of the big challenges that we faced. And the politicization of collaboration and interaction. And again, maybe it's easier in fundamental research. It's easier in hard science. In my own area, the study of international relations, it is, of course, immensely difficult because we're at the heart of that firestorm. And there are legitimate reasons, strategic reasons, security reasons, why people want to constrain or control the flow of discussion. Um, but it is fundamentally important that we maintain both the flow of discussion and the ability of, quote unquote, our own academics to be able to develop their specialist knowledge of other parts of the world. This is a huge problem. There's this turning inwards in so many societies, making a career out of specializing in other countries, which is a whole career choice, is an extremely difficult thing for many young academics. And yet if we don't have that, and after all, these people are going to bring both knowledge, but they're also going to bring their networks of what goes on in other places. So I really do worry about what academic deglobalization, the politicization um, of collaboration. We've been here before. We saw it during the Cold War. We saw the politicization and the muddling of those different roles because academics, they want money. It's quite easy to be drawn into the closed world of debating politicians because that's where influence is, that's where um, money is. And yet, this is where we come back to the sort of the old virtues of academia. Academic integrity, independence, the ability to stand back from political agendas, even if you share them, which is the crucial point. It's not that you don't agree or disagree with a political line, but academic independence means that you have to achieve the different kinds of distance from those debates in order to be able to add something to those debates. Thank you very much. And let's hand over that to Geraldine. Yeah, please. <laughs> On a university level, as a president, what do you do to maintain this distance and independence for your researchers? Well, um, I think it is very important that we um, establish and um, live a common um, understanding um, about what science is about. And I feel, if I can go back to this uh, crisis we are in, there's a general tendency of society and also of politics, which is quite normal because of the elections, that um, we want also ask for the output and the quick uh, successes and which we can celebrate and we can say, okay, it was worth to put money on it because now we have the success. But the big crises don't work like this. I mean, there can be uh, there can be successes that we see for uh, like, like the vaccination for the for COVID, for example, but. Um uh, talking about climate change and research and that field, as you said, there are so many disciplines involved and we are far away from solving this. And this will not be a success we have next year. So there we really need the feeling that it's okay to be in the process, that we can fail with some research and that we still need the commitment that these 
big crises, big challenges that we have to face them over the next decades. And the, we cannot simply say, no, uh, uh, currently we cannot uh, face climate change anymore because we are in a war. This is, this is no possibility. And this is really something we should never forget when we talk about funding and successes in lighthouses and uh, what's the success in science, that we all live in the same boat or in the same world. And this, this is our big task for the future. <laughs> Okay, big task. <laughs> um, Alessandro, what would you say on the European level? Um, what does the European Union do in, or what measures, maybe one measure you find, <laughs> um, that the European Union puts in place in times of crisis to keep this essential exchange also between disciplines and national borders running? I mean, scientific openness has been a, a flagship policy in science uh, in the European Commission. Uh, it was so very much in the past commission. Uh, but uh, I mean, to some extent, we realized that we opened ourselves to the world in a, in a bit of a naive way. Uh, we came with all the best intentions, but unfortunately, not everyone else shares the same best intentions. And being open and collaborating doesn't mean uh, being uh, naive. It doesn't mean uh, being open on everything all the time. Uh, I think one has to be attuned to the geopolitical realities, uh, to the current uh, situation, uh, both in geopolitical terms, but also in economic terms, vis-a-vis uh, -vis countries like China, who have been massively in investing in increasing their scientific technological outputs. Uh, and uh, I think we need a, a, a nuanced and balanced approach to keeping the collaborations open, uh, keeping the exchanges going, especially uh, at the uh, individual level between scientists, the collaboration while at the same time uh, protecting what are our legitimate um, strategic uh, autonomy um, priorities, uh, which as a continent we have. Okay, you see the, thank you very much for this fruitful discussion in this third round and there, it has so many dimensions, our discussion could go at any other point in, in, with another emphasis. Thank you that you kept, kept on track with me and we are still on time. Um, we do a very last sh a short round um, and I really ask you just to complete a sentence, okay, with a few words. And my sentence would be, or my question is, please complete the sentence. If you were to spend more of your working time than those 10%, Andrew, <laughs> on the exchange between science and politics, then... Maybe let's start with you, Andrew. What would happen then? <laughs> um, well, actually, I, I am doing that because I've spent a lot of my career rather preaching the virtues of a sort of distanced academic, which I do think, and I'm now trying to move more into the world of connecting, and I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think I would just go back to what I said, that it's trying to engage politics, politicians, broader society in that space before we get to doing the standard things that academics do. Okay. You didn't listen to what I said. <laughs> Armoran, please complete the sentence. You're trying to stop. If you were to spend more of your working time um, at the exchange between science and politics, then? Then I would uh, receive even more impulses that I would try to um, integrate into the policy making process. And I think that would definitely be very fruitful. Again, at the invitation. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> what about you, Maria? If you were well, to spend more time. Yeah, so um, I, would, I would spend that time on my own luxury because I spend more enough time, uh, certainly more than 38 hour working week on what I'm supposed to. But So the ERC has a mechanism called feedback to policy uh, and it did an analysis of those fields in research. And I, I do not say science, I say research, uh, which includes the humanities and social sciences, um, and looks at them and asks what in the past research has resulted in stuff that is important for, for, for politicians. So I'd be more involved in that, but my luxury would be that I would listen to the science that's been done, especially in those fields that are not my own. So outside the life sciences, that's what I would do with my extra time. Geraldine, what would you do? I think that in, if I would spend more time, um, then we would feel uh, more, even more like partners uh, following the same goals and being together and not against each other. And I think this is one very important thing the Berlin University Alliance stands for. 
Thank you. <laughs> Alessandro, what would you do? I will try to convince politicians that science is not just the business of science ministers. Science is important to inform all areas of policy making and therefore should be something for all politicians to engage with. Thank you very much. Dear audience, please raise both your hands. Big round of applause now <laughs> to our great <laughs> panel. A big applause to yourself. You've been a great audience. Thank you very much. And it was an honor to be your host today. Have a good day and enjoy the conference. See you soon.